I don't think anybody wants to look at me. <laughs> okay, we are streaming, we are live, and let's see, I don't know, oh, whoa, 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 okay, should we move closer? Yeah, I think we should move closer. Okay. Oh, you've got an external mic connected, it wasn't happening yet. No, no, yeah, but this guy's got some, um, also don't want to Let's see here. Okay, yeah, that's that's all right. Jethro is one of these. 
So, I don't want to jump into the chat. Do you like a, a pre unboxing? Yeah, I'll go for it. Show people what you're doing here. Why don't you show them? Here we go, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you haven't spoken yet, so it's kind of like a pre empted gift. I'm not just sitting down. There you go. Please don't do that. But uh, this Ooh. is a coffee hat because obviously it is a stereotype as we love coffee, but it's kind of true. <laughs> real coffee. That's that's like the starter. That's the warm-up. Check that out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very nice. Here. I actually have one of these. It's the greatest piece of swag I've ever seen. The piece of coffee you can put like for hours and hours. Thanks very much. So I didn't do anything. Thank you. <laughs> so that's for speaking. So if you speak, anyone wants to speak. But always, any meetup organizer, that's what they're looking for, is speakers. So please, shout. Um, it's good for your career, it's good for your mind, it's good for your soul, it's good for everyone else. So please, just do it. Um, we have another gift to raffle on later. So don't, don't run away. Um, we'll be doing that. Okay, so I think that's, that's the housekeeping. And... Yeah, take it away, Chief. Right. Um, before I start, I just wanted to check can everyone read the second word, uh, the second line of there? Because if not, I can actually just increase it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Very yes. Well. yes. Let's see. Oh, this. No? Yes. Oh, waiting for Jethro. So you don't have a joke? <laughs> I, I, I have a joke. Okay. okay it's, it's a short one. I can do a long one too. <laughs> it's not a short one. Give us any good. Yeah, it's great, but we'll try. Anyway, um, so this guy um, comes to the doctor. Doctor, doctor, I'm seeing, I'm seeing pink elephants everywhere. Doctor's like, how long has this been going on for? And the guy said, about four days now. He's like, have you seen the psychiatrist? He's like, no, no, just pink elephants.
Because you just have to understand he has five kids. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I have four children. <laughs> so, um, and no pets. So I'm not sure whether I've got five kids. So, <laughs> round up. Yeah. But I do have another. And these all came from my children. I'll let you know. Um, Knock knock. Who's there? Who's there? Interrupting car. Hey! <laughs> 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 hey, actually, Jethro, Jethro has a reputation of being the master of magic. Yeah, they will fail me now. <laughs> Sorry, I don't think that's very much bigger, but that seems to be aggressively uh, against me resizing this. Sorry about that. Cool, all right, let's just check that it actually works. Okay, great. All right, so, uh, now that we've kind of slowly kicked off, <laughs> uh, welcome to Wombat, or Webflow Combat. Um, so this is, this is a little system that we built to get around the horrors of Webflow, uh, which I'll, I'll go into as well, so you will know what's, what's going on. Um, so a little bit about me, that's me, Jeffrey Flanagan. Um, so I'm engineering manager at Office-N, Alex said, how uh, this, and it's a really great spot. Um, I'm working with a small team called the Growth Product Squad, um, and we're mostly working with things that kind of bring people into the market space. So engaging with the community, building systems for people to kind of sign in, and, and log in, and kind of sign up for the whole system. Um, yeah, it's, it's been pretty good. Um, we work a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff that we do as well is also very much with the growth team, uh, which is kind of like marketing, I guess. Um, so they do a lot more than that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the little space that, that we occupy. Uh, and yeah, so this is this is basically about getting Webflow a lot better. Um, it's uh, adding some Git support and allowing rollbacks to work a little bit more elegantly. Uh, improving some core web vitals um, and fixing uh, the issue of not having tests at all in the system and then also allowing you to host it anywhere. Um, right, so let's just set the scene first uh, because some of you might not be familiar with that flow. So what is it? You can kind of see a little video in the background going around. It's very heavily edited with After Effects, so the experience is definitely not like you're seeing over there. Uh, it's very generous uh, on the showcase in this way. Uh, but basically, it's kind of what you see. It's, um, it's a sort of no-code editor um, or website builder, uh, very similar to Squarespace, which if you've seen any YouTube video, you've probably seen somebody saying, please, here's Squarespace, they're sponsoring me. Um, they're not sponsoring me tonight. Uh, I'm just knocking on Webflow by myself. Um, and they also a hosting service. So Webflow, build, you can like build the whole thing. It's a whole package. Build your site with Webflow, and then you can uh, launch it and deploy it and, and sort of showcase it to the world through that system as well. Uh, right. So we chose it for a few reasons. Um, these were sort of way back when. This has been running for quite a while now, actually. I'm not sure how many years, but we've been using it for quite a few years. Um, and we had a very old system that was built on something called a Jira, which is a very ancient CMS uh, with JSON as your kind of source of content. Um, and it was deprecated by the time I joined Office and we kept using it for a while after that, because <laughs> no one wanted to go and like fight that battle of, of moving it over to something else. Um, and then eventually we said, no, no, this is no good. We can't keep using the system. It's just so painful to build new marketing pages that were very dev-centric, kind of every time you wanted to make a change, you needed to develop them. Uh, and that's just a little weird. Even though it had a CMS, it was kind of a weird setup. So we wanted to go and find something that could match the branding that we had over there, all of those marketing pages, which we built a lot. Um, and the branding was really great. Uh, really enjoyed the kind of aesthetic that we had. So we wanted to make sure that we could carry that across in something else. And you can either build something from scratch uh, or Build something that's like kind of not quite from scratch, but is a little bit of an easier kickoff point. Um, and we wanted something that other people who weren't developers could use, but didn't require us to build every single component uh, as, as an engineer. Um, and we could kind of like plug and play a few pieces um, together. And so that's what we were hoping for. Um, Webflow seemed to be the best match for that. 
Um, so you can kind of create and build stuff without needing developers, uh, which is really great. It was, it's also really easy to set up. Um, and yeah, I mean, the whole thing was like really straightforward to use and work with. And you can kind of like from that previous image, you can see there was like just some CSS properties on the side presented in a much more friendly way. Um, so there's things like padding and stuff, and you don't need to be an expert in HTML and CSS to be able to build the stuff like reasonably well. Um, so you can get quite a nice page, as long as you've got some basic building blocks and a little bit of guidance, uh, people who weren't engineers can build stuff. And our early prototypes worked out really well. Um, and so it seemed like a good bet. But like many things, it was a little too easy. Uh, and we started to see things down the line a few months after we'd been porting stuff that maybe it was a little bit more rocky. And about a year later, uh, it was really tough, and we noticed some massive problems in the system. Uh, as these projects scaled out, it just became more and more cumbersome. So Webflow is kind of actually way more oriented towards small scale, hey, you don't have a developer because there's like three people in this company. Here's how you can build a site. Uh, we were trying to scale it. Uh, which ultimately didn't work. So uh, some of the problems around it is that there's just a single CSS file for every single page in the project. Uh, that, that can get really chunky, like several megs big for one CSS file, and that's on every page. Uh, so anytime somebody comes there that's like just smashing the download time. Uh, then yeah, there's some sort of scripts that they're injecting that you can't turn off. Uh, the, all of these scripts are sort of set to render block, so that means like as the page is trying to render, it gets the script and just pauses, so the whole page is waiting, and it looks like it's just frozen for a while. Um, their files were really massive, so they have this like giant script file loading tons of content. I have no idea what's inside that script file. I tried to dig in, and then I stopped really quickly because it was a nightmare. Um, so it wasn't a very easy thing to go and change and fix and remove. Um, but like kind of their entire tool set is baked in there regardless of what you need in the project, it seems. Um, they have TypeKit integration, which is now Adobe font, so since they bought it, Adobe, all of their source code still refers to TypeKit, so I guess they didn't bother changing the name. But all of that also loads synchronously, so it like blocks the page as the font is trying to load and then switches out. Very kind of clumsy. And for a long while, their post was pretty unstable. Um, so we use Pendant as a tool to check are our sites up and running? Just a very basic one. There's a bunch of other tools we have. Penguin's really great for, for doing some basic stuff like that. And every now and again, Webflow would just be offline. And that's our site, right? Like, we're, these are our landing pages for people to come and join as, as developers or companies. And if that's down, you've just lost your business. So it was catastrophically bad. It turned out just very long load times. Um, and their pings were so bad that their server just seemed to be offline. Like, that's how bad. So we needed a replacement. I don't know what that's like now, uh, hopefully better, uh, but this lasted for quite a few months. Um, and it's really hard to migrate away from something that you kind of fall into and built all of these pages into, right? Um, so then, uh, yeah, some other things for developers. Uh, because obviously while developers are, so we don't want them to be involved in building all this stuff, we kind of had to start it off. Um, and every now and again, we're adding stuff to the system as well. And there's no source control, right? This is like kind of plug and play inside some online cloud service. And they have sort of versioning. I'll show you an image of it later. It's not very helpful. Um, there wasn't an easy way of doing rollbacks without understanding what you were actually loading back. Uh, if you publish stuff, so if anyone, if you were making a change over here and you decided to publish, somebody else's work goes live as well, whether they're finished or not. <laughs> That's a great experience. <laughs> we have that happen a lot. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then it's a mad rush to go and find out what the heck has happened, try to roll it back, and generally, because you're too scared to roll back, you just try and fix the problem, and it's live and broken, and so, yeah, it, it creates its own nightmares. Uh, there's no server side access, which I guess is actually okay for most things, but, yeah, you can't do sort of very custom rendering or switching out stuff on the pages a little bit more elegantly, it's all client side. So that, again, impacts on, like, kind of page loads at a time and all that sort of stuff. It's a bit frustrating. There's also no tests. Uh, there were a number of times when people just published the site and it went live, and we had stuff in there that shouldn't have gone live. Um, so, you know, uh, we have some like local development tooling that we were using in there, and it went, went up. And uh, suddenly we had things that might just break for users, and so we had to like turn it off and like try and fix it, and that's a real nightmare. Um, 
And yeah, so then the other aspect is when you're coding in this, uh, it's, a, it's a really <laughs> not enthralling experience. Uh, so JetBrains is kind of the way that you want to go, VS Code, all of that sort of stuff. Over here, there's a little pop-up that shows a space where you drop in some embedded code. So you add your little script tag and you just start typing in essentially a text block. Um, and that's, that's a beautiful coding editor. Uh, and all of the code is run through jQuery because that's what they run in the system. Also, we had a little tools to even hook into jQuery because it loads after all of the embedded scripts run. So we had to like run polling to check is jQuery even ready? And, you know, it's a, a lot of effort. Um, and then there's a lot of usability issues. Uh, but I'm, I'm not really going to talk about those. There are a lot. Uh, that's, that's what it feels like using Webflow sometimes. <laughs> It's not always bad if you've got something smaller, it's really, I'm, I'm knocking on it a lot, I'm talking more about it being used at scale. So I think if you're using it in a small space and you just want a few pages, totally fine. If you're trying to run it as a company with multiple people editing at a time, it's not going to work. There's one person at a time editing the site. Uh, if somebody else wants to change it, you have to keep them into the other person off. <coughs> so yeah, it's a little bit rough. Right, but this is all about like going back to trying to improve some of the performance. Um, so let's just have a look at how we measure that sort of stuff. So we use uh, Core Web Vitals to measure all of these things. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with it. Uh, this is something that Google kicked off back in the day, I guess for another way of uh, improving the web and also adjusting the SEO ranking. Uh, better Core Web Vitals leads to better SEO. So, uh, but it's a really nice initiative. It's, it's really about what the real experience is for users. You know, they're, they're trying to make this programmatic, uh, but they're mimicking the experience that you would get if you landed on a page. So the, the kind of configurations on how fast something should load, um, and what people should see the first time they see a site, it's, it's designed around what your kind of perception of a thing is. Not necessarily the kind of uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the fastest thing, it just needs to feel fast. So that's kind of what these, these core web vitals are trying to get to. And they used to have something that was sort of lab core web vitals, which was isolated, you're doing stuff without any other users seeing it. They seem to have kind of deprecated that in the last call, or at least suggested you don't really use it. And now they're looking at kind of just the real world experience, which is called uh, PageSpeed Insights, I think. And that's kind of, it, it shows you what, what their engine sees, so like they've got a server somewhere, like getting the pages, pulling some data, uh, but it also shows you what real users are experiencing. So if this page is live, you can actually see how other users are interacting with their site, and that can vary drastically depending on where your audience is located, what their sort of stuff is, and what, what they're using, or their devices, and things like that. So it's a, a far better measurement than the lab tooling. <clears throat> So here's a kind of a quick look at what some of those metrics look like. So on the, the far left hand side, the performance circle is your kind of your big, this is, this is how good your site is overall. So that's the thing to like really care about. Everything else is, um, you can go and look into it, I'm not going to give too many details about everything, but there's some good stuff on like making your page a little bit more accessible, best practices just in general development, there's like lots of stuff that affects these scores, same with SEO, there's a ton of things that go into every one of these numbers. Um, but yeah, I'll go over a few of them just to kind of see what they mean um, and a little bit how they work. So there's uh, one is called the largest contentful paint, um, and it's the largest image that is in your viewport sort of the first time you come to a page. So a lot of this sort of works above the fold, which is a bit weird, but um, yeah, it's kind of the first thing that people will see that is big. And what does big mean? Not entirely sure, but the biggest thing on your page at the time. So maybe the biggest div, the biggest image. They only count certain things, but essentially text or simple images. They don't count SVGs for some reason, but there we go. Uh, and then something similar to that is first content or page. So what's the first thing somebody sees on the screen? The initial thing that loads. Maybe it's a little piece of text. Um, you know, maybe it's a logo or something like that. It's just like, what is that? And you can see, like previously, there's some metrics behind these things. So, you know, the largest content will paint, you want about two and a half seconds, and that starts being, that's pretty good under that time. And for first content will paint, a little bit faster than that. You want something to appear quickly, because otherwise you're just looking at a blank screen, right? Like it's just like this page sitting there doing nothing. Uh, then there's the speed index. This seems to have been sort of reduced in importance over the last long while. 
but initially we were looking at this for a while. Um, and there's this very complicated integration uh, integral, I think is what that is. Uh, it's basically saying, how fast does it take for content to sort of appear and fully render on the page? Um, and that's, that's gotten a little bit more complicated because it's all about the fold. And now we've got these things. So I don't really know which fold they're talking about, but you know, this uh, just makes it hard. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, uh, it's very nebulous what about the fold is. And all their documentation says, you know, generally the first kind of stuff on most devices, which is not very meaningful. So uh, <laughs> good luck in printing some of these things. So a little bit of guesswork uh, as you go along. Uh, so what we want to do is just focus on some some basics because there's a lot of stuff. There's, so there's way more metrics that were on the screen uh, over there, and there's lots of directions you can go and stuff. They have some really great insights onto what you can actually do to go and improve the stuff. And kind of like collect and say, cool, these sort of changes affect the score, and so that's really helpful. But there's a lot to look at, right? I mean, it can just seem insurmountable. Um, and so we actually had an SEO expert come in um, and tell us what was the thing to focus on because none of us are like hardcore SEO experts. We've got some basics down, but um, there's a lot out there. We, did, uh, we wanted to do some competitor analysis. We're also as offers in expanding into Europe and there it, it makes a big difference if we don't like hit Google on the first page, right? And we want our SEO to be improved, so qualified as needs to be. Um, and yeah, so the uh, uh, expert was saying that uh, the largest content of paint, or LCP, is the thing to go for. But these other things were good things to kind of keep in mind and see where the scores are going every time we made changes. So we want to make one score better of everything else works. So obviously we care about like, after everything that I was showing, also the overall score just in general was a big factor in the kind of changes we made. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Whole lot of other things. There's like time to first byte, which is kind of your server response time, um, your total blocking time, which is like when um, scripts take a while to load and things are getting paused on the screen when it's rendering um, and they're taking up a lot of time to sort of just deal with JavaScript. That's your total blocking time. Um, time to interactive is how long it takes before you can click stuff, but it's sort of started counting after about five seconds of your page doing nothing uh, for a while and not interrupting you. Uh, these are kind of a bit more hard to deal with, uh, certainly for us with Webflow, these seemed like really hard to deal with, so we kind of pushed them into the background and so with the LCP instead. Right, so there's a lot to fix in Webflow. Um, yeah, we wanted to uh, have a look at uh, some other options um, of what we could do. Um, so could we just fix stuff manually in the pages? Definitely, right? You can go and change all of the assets and things like that. If you've ever used the asset tool in Webflow, you'll know that that is a very painful experience. It often swaps out the wrong image for some reason. Um, and then you just got this giant library of the same pictures all over the place, and then you lose what's going on. It also, uh, interaction on these things, like opening up the image asset loader, I think it took me 15 seconds per click. That was like clicking on a thing to say load this image, change to this image, wait for the library to load, click it, and then it was the wrong thing. And also, if you hover over other images, it swaps to those. Um, so don't, don't do that. Um, so yes, we could do this. It would take a very long time. We should still do it. So we did it for a bunch of pages, and then we stopped because uh, the engineers and the team were crying. Um, and you know, we wanted to make some alternative approaches. Uh, so then we thought, well, hey, let's just rebuild it again and something else. Uh, but if we did that, I'd probably be doing the same talk, just about something else. Um, you know, if software always goes wrong, especially when you start from scratch. And so I wanted to see, maybe, maybe we could get Webflow to actually do something for us and still work and still kind of get better and close enough and improve our experience somehow. We wanted like a smooth flowing machine. Uh, it's not quite what we got, but we got a little bit closer. Uh, so yeah, this was actually the concept uh, came out of uh, ideation sessions that we run. So in our growth product team, all the engineers get together and kind of every now and again, uh, so we do it every few weeks, uh, is just think about engineering issues that you're having in the, in the kind of product space. And what can we do to improve it? And one of the ideas was like actually kind of coming up with this Wombat system. Um, and so that was a cool start. And we were just thinking like maybe we can try and spike an idea and see is this actually going to work? Um, so we started with the pages that Webflow generated. So once you publish, 
It's obviously generating a whole lot of pages, and that's what's served on the web, so we're going to start with that. Because we can't take anything beforehand, it's too hard to like, sort of dive into the system. Let's just see, can we modify things that are outside of it? Um, and yeah, basically took some pages that were generated and went and edited them manually to try and improve the scores. Uh, and then just would make some changes and test core vitals a few times. If you've ever done this workflow, it's really, really frustrating because you test a page and the core vital scores come up with a whole lot of stuff and you're like, sweet, let me just double check that. And they're completely different, completely different scores, no idea what's going on. Um, and it turns out they sort of vary all over the place uh, often. Uh, there's actually some great approaches to fixing that. So if you can kind of run something, uh, this, uh, we use another system called Datadog, uh, where you can run uh, real-time user metrics or run. And that injects, it actually, it runs a little bit of JavaScript, so there's a little bit of the cost of doing it, but it constantly checks the core vitals. They're a little bit different to what uh, Google is using, uh, which is called Lighthouse under the hood. Um, but at least they give you something that you can see and it shows you over time what that's looking like. Because you actually kind of want the average scores. You don't want what have I got just right now. So basically, we run some tests and test like maybe 10 or so times just to see every few hours, like, has it changed and just check that what the, the changes we're making make sense. So there's a lot of guesswork in some of the, the prototyping stuff. Um, and also, we wanted to make those changes that we were doing manually very programmable, because uh, it doesn't help if you have to do it all manually. Uh, we want this to be an automatic system. And yeah, and then we, we tested that prototype around and yeah, got some, got some fairly good results uh, that, that were indicative of this is the right direction to go. Um, but yeah, so uh, let's, let's dive into a little bit of what the system is doing and how it improves things. Because it's not just improving core vitals, it's also about adding these other things, um, like it's uh, source control of things. So I'll take you through all of that. So, uh, here's the workflow. This is slightly simplified, but uh, it's pretty much the process. Um, so I'll just dive into each one. Uh, maybe a little bit small on the screen, um, so I'll just sort of explain uh, as we go. Let me see if I can uh, just draw so you can kind of see. Uh, no, not really. I'll use my mouse cursor. <laughs> you can maybe see it over here. So yeah, this is basically, so Webflow uh, publishes a project and they have, uh, then we have a webhook that gets fired off. So you can connect webhooks into, into Webflow and then they go off and it just fires off whatever the project name is or the project domain actually. Um, and then it's, uh, so we use that to trigger something inside GitHub, so it runs an action for us. And yeah, basically, so it's a bit hard to kind of focus where my mouse is over there. Um, and then we just check, is this going to production? So on Webflow, um, we actually have, uh, so this is what it looks like when you publish Webflow, at least for us, is we have Webflow.io domains, that's what you get by default, uh, that's the top one, and then at the bottom is a domain that we mapped to Office in. Uh, so that's actually served on our domain, it's like whatever, like project.officeair.com, so it's getting the actual name for now, but it's sitting on a side domain that we have. Uh, and we, we want it to be so that like only when you hit the one that has officein.com in, that's sort of production. And other stuff is if you're just testing things, you can want to fire off this whole system with that stuff. Um, yeah, so I'm going to move the mouse and we can just sort of count if there's uh, confusion. But anyway, so then what we did is at this point, uh, we started scraping with it. So we waited for it to publish, and we're going to kick off a scraping action. And this is all running inside GitHub Actions. Uh, so if it's staging, don't do anything. But if it's in production, go read the sitemap. Um, our actual sitemap is not served from Webflow. We don't use it at all, in fact. Um, we have a very different sitemap system set up. Uh, but over here, we just want to see all the pages that are sitting over there. Um, and the easiest way is just like pick up their own sitemap. And then uh, essentially, we scrape all of that stuff, uh, so all of the HTML and all of the assets that it's pointing to, at least its own assets, right? So Webflow stores stuff. I think they actually use Google in the background, but they have their own sort of CDN uh, naming on it. And we just go and find those assets and all the assets inside those. So we kind of recursively check, give me everything that, that is in Webflow. If there's stuff that is sort of hosted separately outside of Webflow, we don't care about it. Uh, we're just going to leave it and let it work like the normal internet. So if that stuff goes down, stuff goes down on page, we just have to deal with it. Uh, we don't want to like host absolutely everything. Uh, so we just think we let's look at the system a little bit. And then the big purple block over there, that's where we go through uh, 
for every single page, essentially, we're going through all of the stuff, and then we, we're actually dropping this into the current repo. A little bit of a hack, uh, but we were early and new to GitHub Actions, didn't really know what we were doing, so we wanted to simplify project complexity a little bit. Um, and so basically, we just copy it into the current project. Um, and we're doing that so we can get some PRs data. Uh, so it's a little bit weird, the plugins and Wombat are sort of sitting with the actual Webflow assets. A little bit strange, I know, maybe something to improve later, but anyway, this is how we do it. So we take all the assets and put it in an assets folder, and take the pages and uh, put them in their own uh, little project name folder. Right, and then after that, um, we make a, a PR branch inside the uh, inside the repo, so this is all automatic as well, all running through actions, um, and then we we run some tests on the HTML. Uh, and I'll take you through a few of these steps as well, um, and we just make sure if these tests are passing, cool, carry on. Otherwise, alert us on Slack. Right, something's gone wrong. And I'll show you the test is actually quite straightforward that we're doing, but. It just lets us know, hey, somebody tried to publish something and it completely failed for some reason. Uh, if it succeeds, then we're going to auto merge the PR and delete the branch. And that seems like a strange idea. Like you're sort of putting it in, in GitHub to, to do all of this stuff. Maybe you want to control when you're publishing things because it's really easy to accidentally publish on Webflow. And we did that for a while. And about 200 PRs later, uh, that no one had merged in, we stopped doing that and auto allowed it to just go through and worked out a way of like sort of backtracking a mistake. Uh, because uh, the growth team was using this a lot as well and it handles every single one of our Webflow projects of which we've got quite a few. Um, and so yeah, that, that seemed like that was going to be a tough time for engineers to go and actually manually review the yeah. So they just accept it, let it go through and come back later if there's a problem. Right, so that uh, little green block at the top is when we, we're going to start creating the build. So we just run a simple yarn build. Uh, it's a pretty small script uh, running through this stuff. Uh, but it basically goes and takes, oh, that track, sorry. It takes everything inside the compare folder and moves it over to the static folder. Uh, so that's a folder that we're not actually saving into the repo at all. Uh, all the content up there is getting ignored. But this is going to be our build steps, right? Uh, so we need something to like, build and modify from the original compared uh, content. Uh, we do some, some rewriting to point at uh, better places, I'll take you through some of the details of this, and then we apply uh, core web vital optimizations to it, and then we're gonna upload that to S3 and serve it on, on the cloud front. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty straightforward process. I know there's a bunch of steps, but it's actually not a lot of things that it needs to do. It took a while to get there though. Um, but yeah, let's have a look at some of the tests that we're doing. So this is what I was talking about uh, with Webflow. So when you're coding in Webflow, uh, this is what it looks like at the bottom of the screen. You have a little HTML embed editor, uh, which is essentially just a text block. They're very nice and they've given us some syntax highlighting. That's about all they've given us. Um, it doesn't do very much beyond that. So you, we normally just drop a script thing in there and um, link to some scripts. We've got a CDN uh, JS deliver. Uh, but we actually used to, back in the early days, just write script tags and code directly in there. That is a bad experience, don't do that. Uh, that's a horrible time. Definitely link externally for your files. Um, so basically, there's this file over here, and yeah, we're pointing at a CDN, but when we get to local development, the source for that is NROC. Uh, so if you're not familiar with NROC, it just uh, opens up a server on your machine, and you can serve some content to the web. So your machine ex is exposed to the internet. And essentially, then we can just write code on in like VS Code, for example, and every time you save, you can reload the web folder, um, and you can see those changes. So it's a nice experience. So you can run that on the staging thing. Um, but uh, if Engrok is sitting in your site when you go live and publish it, you're in for a bad time. Suddenly, it's pointing at your box. Uh, people that are trying to subscribe to newsletters, they try to sign up for your service, they're just going to your local machine. So super bad for uh, your business in that no one's going to your business. Also pretty bad for Papia and for GPR. Uh, all of these things are <laughs> just not a great experience. So we wanted that to stop, right? Um, so we wrote some. Uh, we wrote a very simple test test, uh, and you can add more. It's really easy to add a few more, so that you can kind of follow the same pattern. But that's a very complicated test with a whole lot of uh, things. So essentially, what we're saying is, hey, check that you're not on staging. 
Uh, otherwise, I don't care about this, let people on stage and do stuff. Uh, and then go and have a look at every single page and see, does NGROC, does the text NGROC exist in this page? Uh, and then fail the site at that point. So we're just gonna count how many NGROCs have here, so that means that if somebody had like three uh, sources, uh, three scripts sitting over there, all the resources pointing to NGROC, and then you say, hey, three of these are sitting on the page. They don't try and change one, publish, and then notice some of the errors, because that's just an irritating experience. So a very basic test, but it saved us a lot. We went live with NGROC too many times. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there was some, some very uh, rough moments on a Monday morning where somebody published something and you're like, oh no, and everything's down. So, anyway, uh, it's about that. So, I'll take you through some of the other plugins that we've baked into this. Um, and this is, uh, this is to do with the Core Web Vitals improvements. Um, so, back over here, looking at the thing, plugins are this space. So, just before we go live, essentially, just before we copy everything up to S3, we can have a look at that stuff. Um, but before I go into plugins, uh, let's talk about defer versus async script, right? So this is kind of how your browser works uh, for things. Um, so if you could just imagine that green bar at the top, that is your browser rendering, right? And uh, when it has that little darker space over here, so this spot over there, that is, it stopped rendering, it's paused, it's waiting while it loads a script, right? So this JavaScript over there loads up and tries to run, right? And that freezes your browser from rendering the screen. And then afterwards, once you're done running, uh, it'll continue rendering, right? Um, and so what you can do to get around that is do what's called async scripts, right? So you can actually, uh, all you have to do is add an attribute that says async on your script tag, and then it's separate from the rendering, and it's not gonna affect rendering. So you can see these yellow blocks, they're not changing how the rendering happens. They can happen like during the page as it's going. They might slow down the page if they're very complicated JavaScript, but they're not stopping it from running. And then they can also run afterwards. So once your page is fully loaded, you can just, they, they will be firing. The downside is you can't guarantee the order. So if an async script loads faster than one that you declare afterwards, uh, you know, like it'll it'll just like load, it'll run them in like weird orders sometimes, and it's hard to sequence things. And sometimes you want to sequence stuff, uh, so that can get complicated. Uh, then the alternative approach is deferring. So what happens is you get to a script. It also doesn't break rendering, but it just loads that script up, right? So it's just loading that JavaScript into memory, but it'll only execute it once the page is finished. And also another benefit, it keeps the sequence order of the, the way you declared them. So in the bottom script, you can see you've got to declare afterwards, so it like waits for the, third, for the whole script of the previous one to run, and then it runs the next one, because everything's single thread. So yeah, it's not, not like fully true in all cases, but like generally in terms of the browser, it's single thread with the JavaScript stuff. Cool. So uh, we wanted to make stuff asynchronous and deferred. Uh, and so this is the typekit thing. So basically what happens is, Type gets, uh, type gets gets loaded up, um, uh, automatically injected uh, by Webflow, and we just want to say, hey, go find where you load it, and add an async true. It's just like part of the type API, so not, not particularly fancy. Uh, we could have manually done this, but then it turns out it's like really awkward for designers to choose fonts correctly in Webflow. Maybe that's different now, but it certainly was troublesome at the time. So we just adjust the, the context. It's like very basic changes. We're just replacing a little bit of text somewhere. Right? It's not doing a lot. Um, and then when we get to deferring the JS, uh, yeah, that, that looks a little bit complicated. Uh, there's a giant bit of uh, uh, regular expressions over there, uh, which I know are a nightmare for everyone. I would have to sit down and take a while to remember what this is doing. Uh, so I think I wrote some notes. But yeah, basically what it's doing is it's finding a script somewhere in the page, so that's just like random HTML, I actually took it from Webflow somewhere, and it just needs to make sure it only finds the Webflow specific script, which changes its name every single time you deploy it, right? Because this stuff is sitting on a CDN, and the cache by thing, so it's got a different name all the time, so we had to try and find all the name variations, and that's what that uh, regular expression is doing, while also avoiding our own scripts or other scripts that are legitimate. So that's just, just find this one thing and defer it. Uh, just so it stops like smashing your render. And I think that script is actually sitting like really close to the top, if I remember correctly. So it like really slowed down the site. 
And then we got to the, the more interesting stuff. Um, I found this to be the most helpful. So basically, we wanted every single, we wanted to get rid of this giant CSS file. Like this was just way too big for us. And somebody really awesome, many years ago, made a project called UnCSS. And essentially, all it does is it takes a CSS file and XML. I think it, it can actually work with multiple CSS files um, and uh, potentially multiple XML files. Uh, but yeah, essentially, it just looks at it and goes, cool, which rules are not in this page, right? And that's quite complicated because of CSS specificity and the cascading nature of it all. So it does a lot of like really smart stuff to get rid of these rules. But over here, if we had a button on the screen and then we were referring to something else, like some other class that didn't appear in the page, it would just wipe it out, right? Just deletes it. Um, and then you get a nice small file afterwards for the CSS, depending on how untidy it's been. Uh, Webflow has been very untidy. So yeah, basically you can see Webflow starts with like a meg to almost two megs of data for the CSS files. Uh, that is painful. Um, and so then we, uh, what we do is we take, uh, we go to read the, the CSS file, we just take it from online, and then we load it up as a string. So in CSS, you can actually uh, go and ask it to query and get a CSS file. It turns out that broke all the time. So we just load it up into memory, so that's two megs of some text in memory. It's fine, it seems to handle it okay. Uh, and then we just run in CSS for the current HTML page. Uh, and then, cool, uh, it's, it's done. We save it for that page as a custom thing, and you can see like we get a massive reduction, right? down to 30 kilobytes in some of the best cases. Uh, but even to almost 200 kilobytes is not terrible compared to almost two megs. So like massive benefits into doing this sort of setup. Uh, this is what the code looks like, also a little bit weird. Um, so you can see there's some sort of raw CSS that we're adding in. This is just the API that they have. Um, then we're ignoring CSS sheets because we don't want it to go and find that stuff online. We're giving it the sheet. Uh, and we also don't care about any other CSS that somebody may have added to the thing. We're just optimizing for Webflow stuff. Uh, we don't want to break anyone else's code. Uh, and so we just let that, uh, just ignore that. And then you can see there's like some weird other regex happening over there. Essentially, what we want to make sure is that all of Webflow's classes are not part of this optimization. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, after about a month of us running uh, Wombat, we found that some of our stuff just didn't work. Uh, we added a new navigation, like completely revamped the nav. And when it went live, uh, after thorough testing everywhere else, went live, it just didn't work. Uh, you couldn't click stuff. And it turns out, like, that's because we were optimizing stuff that was out of the page, and they were adding uh, classes through JS, right? So we were like, oh, okay, go ahead and find that stuff and just ignore anything that Webflow is doing with its sort of special internal components. Uh, we do the same stuff for ourselves because sometimes we add some JavaScript classes, um, so we do the dirty thing of styling our JS dash classes, uh, but we use those just in case something would normally be hidden, and yeah, we just ignore attribute changes because that might not appear in the page, but there could be some complicated scenario where that is actually needed. Uh, so that basically means you know it can target like paragraph tags and things like that. We don't remove those rules. Uh, and there were yeah some really weird bugs that happened before we made those in more cases. That was a that was a tough life. Uh, right, uh, but on to some source control. Uh, so this was a big thing for us because Webflow was painful with us. Uh, so we wanted to find a way of getting like some pull requests going uh, and being able to roll back changes and then also host it somewhere else. Uh, we had to host it somewhere else anyway because you can't make changes and then send it back to Webflow. Turns out they don't want to do that sort of thing, which is uh, yeah, a little bit rude, but anyway. <laughs> um, so on the source control thing. Uh, so basically we're taking all the assets, so they're sitting in the compare assets folder, and then each project uh, is sitting in, in the compare folder as well. Uh, so this is all added to the repo with its own URL. So it's just based on the kind of uh, Webflow domain name or our internal name, so project.offizen.whatever uh, the URL is. Um, and this is this is what we're going to use for making the actual builds. So you can kind of see a little screenshot of what that looks like in GitHub. Um, not super exciting, but it's just it's a folder. Um, so what we do is, once we've added that all into source, we just we branch out and then we create a pull request. Um, so here's an example of that pull request. 
I don't know if you can see the number, but on the top right, uh, we added 22,000 lines of code. Um, so obviously that's, <laughs> that I think is from the CSS that got added. You can see a new CSS file sitting at the top. That is how long these CSS files are. Um, so probably 99% of this PR is just a CSS file uh, change. Uh, what we do is, if we want to go and see what's actually over here, we'll just go and do some text searches in the HTML files that have been changed. So then we can actually see what has happened in this particular PR if we need to go and investigate and work out how far back to roll uh, a system change. Um, yeah, and then basically part of the build step is, um, so all the plugins are applied to the compare thing once we get rid of the static. We need to rewrite the assets, right? So all the assets are still pointing to webflow.io or the CDN or whatever it happens to be. So just go and take that and point it to our new host, which for us is an S3 bucket somewhere. Um, so we just basically, a little bit weird and complicated to do all of that stuff, but we go and find all of the paths and go and change them. And it turns out we missed a few of my points as well. Uh, that was fun to go and find out my stuff just wasn't working. Uh, but we seem to fix that, so, so that's cool. Um, Right, and then yeah, hosting. Hosting is very straightforward. Uh, we're just popping this in S3 bucket somewhere. So that means it's not doing any server side rendering or anything like that. It's just raw HTML, CSS, JS files. It's nothing fancy. It's just like a very simple HTML uh, server page. Uh, we actually use GitHub pages for the prototype. That worked okay. So you don't have to follow the same pattern of using the more expensive Amazon uh, sort of services. Post it wherever you like. The cell could work, uh, Heroku, whatever else you want. Heroku's no longer free, so maybe somebody else. But anyway, uh, GitHub Pages is free. And it's not too bad. Uh, it was a little bit sluggish. The um, sort of time to first bind or the kind of server response time was a bit slow, so we moved away from that. But could work in a pitch. Um, so this is what rollbacks look like. So this is actually how it works in, in Redflow. And uh, you see it's just a list of names. I don't know if you can make it up, but it just says, Automatic backup, and then something like 5,300 elements and 1,600 styles. That's that's all the information you get. That's as, as much information as you're going to get ever. Uh, all of these things say the same sort of thing. Uh, sometimes those numbers change. I don't know what they mean. Uh, it's not very helpful. You can make uh, name backups. It seems like it's kind of cut off some of the image over here, but uh, there's a little new backup. Uh, possible at the top um, that you can sort of name a backup. So if you're doing a big set of changes, we've used that a, a few times before and then had to roll back, but it's you know it's at least the same thing. Pretty punky though. Um, so we switched it out instead into uh, part of the source code now, right? So then you can see us actually doing a revert on a publish. Um, so we're just reverting the merge request. This is actually a little fun bit of history. Uh, that's the first time we realized oh, we needed to deploy the site without scraping first, because if we're going to deploy the old site, all of the assets are wrong. So we actually have to use the existing assets that we have, so then we added that little deploy without scraping file, uh, which is a GitHub action. Um, and so, yeah, this was our first time when we uh, had to go and make this change, because something went horribly wrong on, on Webflow, and we just rolled back the change super quick. Uh, it took us a little bit of time to write that, but now those changes are like instant deploys, uh, which is really great or relatively quick to close the case. Um, and yeah, so you can see uh, in the, so this is open source repo. Um, it's not quite the repo that we're using. I went and removed anything that, that was like sort of very specific to offers in, um, and then open source that. Uh, so there's like a little placeholder action for you to go and have a look at, uh, which allows you to go and plug in your own site variables and just backtrack it. So you have to do this for every project, but um, yeah, seems to work pretty well. So just redeploys the site using the current existing assets, essentially it's skipping all those steps, which is quite nice. So, did it work? <laughs> it's kind of really where we came to. Those initial tests were pretty good. Don't know how the other things went, right? So, um, here's some measurements. Uh, I'm not going to leave this on the screen for too long. But essentially, anything that's in green is good, and anything in red is bad. You can kind of see the severity of how bad it is. At the bottom, um, just because this is uh, this is like way too complicated to show a whole spreadsheet, um, but essentially this is the differences between two measurements, so the before and after, the sort of the uh, existing system in Webflow directly and our new system using Wombat, uh, and you can see that um, so the kind of big performance rates are a big sort of 
overall score varies from 25 to 50. That's terrible scores. Don't, don't have scores like that. They're really bad. But you can see how desperate we were for like any performance changes on these pages. Um, and so they now vary. We did like on the employer's page a massive 20 points improvement, which is just like huge uh, stuff. Didn't quite work out for community. I'm not really entirely sure when when wrong over there, but I think the uh, you can see the LCP score is quite a bit lower, so that didn't quite work out. But in general, like uh, but some averages underneath. In general, it was quite favorable. Um, having a look at some of these pages, so even when it went wrong, you can see like on the far side, Times Interactive like went way worse, right? Uh, and we're generally a second or so over. Uh, I guess the average is up, but maybe three seconds in some cases. Uh, but that's out of 13 to 24 seconds, right? So it's not as catastrophic as that. So generally pretty good. Things like layout shift were pretty much a non-entity, so it didn't really bother us. But we didn't care about blocking time, but it seemed to improve it. Um, and the same with response time, that's sort of all over the place. But when it actually averages up to almost exactly zero when we ran the test, there's obviously a whole lot of figures after those numbers, uh, after the decimal points. Uh, but for some reason, I think it ends up being 0, 0, 0, 0.002. Uh, so surprisingly close for some good and some bad experiences on the response time for the server. So Amazon Cloud wasn't, uh, or CloudFront wasn't always faster than Redflow, which is sort of interesting, but it was more sort of standardized. Uh, Our Redflow experience sometimes went so bad, if you remember, that it just looked like the pages were gone. So at least that was a better experience. Uh, so here's some like what those uh, page speed insights look like. I'm just going to go through these quickly. But, um, some of the scores are a little bit uh, hitting on the bottom because uh, I zoomed in a bit. Um, but that's the before, that's the after. So it's like not a massive change, but you can kind of look at the 45 or the 34 in the middle. Oh, uh, so just like that, we're in the middle. Uh, the performance score, about maybe 10 points, that's quite nice. There's some nice changes below as well. You can see like that first content of the paint is that little orange one on the bottom left. And that goes in the green for a change. So that happened to a few scores every now and again, right? So here's a before and after. <coughs> yeah, didn't work for this page so much. I think this was the community page. Um, sometimes it didn't work out, but it wasn't so bad that it was terrible. I think that was kind of the key factor for us is on average, like 80 to 90% of our pages were much better on our scores. Even if it was a little bit, they were better. And that was good enough because this was a kind of a trying to be the magic bullet across our sites. Uh, here's another example, and we actually bumped it up again as well. So uh, this is getting slightly closer to the acceptable range. Still not good enough, but yeah, it was getting there, uh, which is great. These are also the kind of more restrictive schools because we're running mobile tests. I like, noticed all the screenshots on the, like, the mobile picture on the bottom right over there. That's, uh, they, they're way more hectic on the scoring because whatever mobile devices they're using are very sluggish. Uh, so these same scores were in the 90s or 80s for desktop. Um, it's not very meaningful when the scores are looking good, so we wanted to see what the worst case scenario is. Uh, so anyway, that's why we started to move off of this stuff. So, is it safe for anyone else to use it? Uh, yeah, we've been using it for uh, a long while, actually about eight months, and for a good uh, half a year of that time, probably a bit longer, it's been very stable for us. Uh, don't use Webflow though, so if you haven't used Webflow, don't plug it in and assume Wombat's going to solve all your problems. Just avoid Webflow if you can, but if you're in the same boat, hey, give us a go, maybe it'll help you out. Uh, but yeah, essentially this is just a bad day for us, you know, we didn't want, uh, we didn't want to have to go and change the whole system. We wanted something small that we could do in the meantime, so this is kind of to tie us over for a big change later on where we fully replace Webflow, which the team is actually doing next week. We're doing a whole spike to go and like replace it and hopefully make a big improvement. But this has held us over for like a good eight months. Uh, so that's pretty decent. So we can actually focus on some of the uh, critical features that were happening uh, at that time. So uh, if you want to go and use it, uh, you can go fork the one map repo, which will slides afterwards. So all the links are, are plugged in over there. And in terms of doing anything, you can keep it on yourself. It's MIT licensed. Uh, and you can go and uh, fork it and do your own stuff, or you can go and add some issues and some pull requests, whatever. Um, it would be cool to, to see some stuff changing if anyone wants to use it. Uh, yeah, some ideas of what you could do in the future. So you could have automatic image optimization. We were very much considering doing things like automatic WebP conversion and maybe resizing images. Uh, Webflow uh, added something, I think, in the last 
maybe four months uh, now, where you can convert images to WebP, which we have started using quite deliberately. It's a lot faster. It's a little bit more constrained on which browser supported, but it's, it's reasonably good. Um, but yeah, maybe you can bake in some better image optimization. Uh, we've been thinking about that. Um, maybe move all the compare stuff into a new repo because that's pretty untidy where it is. Um, so you can you can fix our, our poor choices. Uh, you can add some end-to-end -end tests. We actually do this. Uh, we have another separate system that runs end-to-end -end tests uh, against the live version because they used to work for Webflow. So whenever Webflow published, we'd go run stuff against production because we be like, we don't know if this is working. Hopefully, all our sites are still up and running. Um, so we just want to integrate that into the thing before you go live instead of having to do it afterwards, like Webflow made us do it. Um, and now with Wombat, we can sort of do something a little bit smarter. We just haven't done an integration yet. Um, and if you really wanted to get crazy, you could serve this on something like Next.js, for example, and do some server-side rendering, but don't do that. Uh, we thought about it, and we realized it was a bad idea. Just rather change to a whole new system if you're going to do like complicated changes to the pages. Uh, but you technically could do some like really complex uh, changes to these things live in response to users if you want to. Cool. Um, and there are some links to stuff. Uh, there's like the whole PageSpeed Insights measuring tool that, we, uh, that I was using, and the Core Web Vitals uh, stuff as well. Um, so you can read up more about these things. Those docs are insanely in depth. They're really, really good. Some of them are, there are a lot to take in. Uh, so yeah, it takes a little while to kind of get through all of it. So just focus on a few things at a time. Cool. That's, that's basically it. Yeah. There's, there's a lot more than just that file, like slowing things down. Like, like a lot of the other scripts are running, and there's stuff that we just can't speed up that's sitting in Webflow that just takes ages to load. There's a whole lot of stuff that they kind of dump on the page that we couldn't optimize away. Also, unfortunately, uh, these are marketing pages, so they're very image heavy. So there's just like, even if you're lazy loading images and doing all sorts of stuff, there's just a whole lot of content getting dumped on the screen. And unfortunately, sort of, those pages were designed before there was a big directive to say, hey, go fix your, fix your core web vitals. So they kind of, we, we kind of built it a little bit wrong to start with. Um, but yeah, I was also very surprised. Um, there are some really cool, like sort of small score changes because of those CSS changes. So the kind of times interactive sometimes got a little bit better, or at least some other parts of the thing that have like prevented blocking. Those are better, but I was hoping for more dramatic changes and they just went there. But the on-page experience felt a bit better. So even though the score doesn't reflect it, for your users, it's still quite beneficial. I think that was still pretty important. How much engineering time do you think you spent on this? <laughs> so uh, the spike was was really quick. It, was, it took a week to get a basic system up and running. And then we were like, sweet, this is easy. Let's take it to production. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a while space. later, yeah, yeah I, I think I think there was um, so the actual a lot of the engineering time went into the GitHub Action workflow because we were not very experienced with it, um, and the platform team had other things to do as well, and we didn't want to bug them so much. And we figured, hey, we could kind of get this going. So it was a very new space. I think ultimately we probably spent um, a good month on on building the kind of the core system. Uh, around all of this and getting it stable enough for deployment and actually working. Um, and then I think another two weeks of testing. Um, so it's not 100% of the time working on it. Um, 
and uh, sort of not, uh, I think it was sort of one dev at a time, so it was myself and another engineer mostly, uh, there were a few other people involved as well every now and again. Um, but yeah, so it wasn't, wasn't a tremendous amount of effort continuously, but there was a lot of time, right? So it's like essentially a month and a half chunk of time from start to sort of reasonable finish. And we did some modifications and fixes afterwards, so maybe another week of time over there, maybe another two weeks, I guess. Uh, not, not sort of 100% time for that, but just like turn around time. Sure, so if you go back to a decision of going down the road, would you make the same decision again? Um, well, kind of told we had to make sure the core web vitals was better, sure. right? Um, from very up high. I mean, I got, I got like a Slack message from <laughs> our CEO <laughs> saying, hey, these things suck. Maybe you should fix them. Um, and uh, yeah, he was right. You know, I mean, like it's, it's a big impact. Uh, and so if instead we went and built a whole different system or found something else, first thing would take us probably another week or two of time to just go and investigate options, do some tests. And that's like sort of being conservative on the sure. road, like maybe a little bit naive on that time estimation. Uh, and then building it and making sure it works and building all the components and migrating all the pages, I think that would have been a good three months of like some serious engineering time with multiple engineers. Um, it sounds a bit crazy. There's probably a few things we could have taken out of the box and kind of you know cut some things off. So maybe we could have done that in the space of like two sprints, which for us is about a month. Um, and had a fairly good answer, but I think we would have been pretty constrained and there still would have been a lot of stuff sitting in wait for it. Uh, so yeah, I guess that was the plus I'm sure. I think would I would I make a different decision? Yeah, I would choose something other than wait for it. Go back a little bit further. Yeah. Yeah. Go back in time. I'm gonna go back there, you know. Sure. <laughs> yeah, if it's sorry, no, no, sorry. Another question. Go for it. Go yeah, first. just uh, almost more of a revolving question. Like if I look at the the advanced and expert level of the thing, things you guys have, have pulled off, it's very questionable that you chose Webflow. You know, that the <laughs> same people who could do this could do that. Who does that? No, when it, so it wasn't necessarily engineers investigating Webflow in the beginning. Uh, we kind of had a look at the decision afterwards um, and we were kind of involved to some degree. So it was, a, it was the kind of the growth team looking at stuff, the design space. But I was certainly involved. I was part of the decision saying, hey, this seems good, right? I made a bad call. <laughs> so somebody else started investigating and I came along afterwards and was like, hey, this seems reasonable. It seems like we can solve our problems and our small scale sites, because they didn't have a lot of content in, were actually pretty reasonable. Interacting with those pages, not so bad. And we, and we didn't think like, oh, one person at a time, it's a bit irritating, it's probably okay. You know, like 50 pages in there and you've got like five people who want to interact with that thing. So that's become a problem. So we didn't really think of the scaling issues nearly as much as we should. Uh, so yeah, made a very bad call and I still regret a lot of it today. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes sometimes uh, people can do good things and bad things uh, in the world, right? <laughs> um, the more away from like the web flow specific, it's just, to you, since you've mentioned stuff like Squarespace and other platforms as well, how specific is the solution completely to Webflow, or would other people be able to take this as a kickoff if they're already stuck in something like Squarespace, which has been around for quite a bit longer? Yeah. I'm pretty sure there are people who stuck with a similar problem, and I'm just wondering if this would be a decent kickoff for them to change yeah. it up. So I think that's a reasonable thing to try and do. Like obviously, there's stuff that's written with specific. sort of Webflow specific content. But I think a lot of the principles could be applied to Squarespace. Maybe it's got some simpler sorts of problems. Uh, we also wrote it in kind of a very plugin architecture way, so you can just add and remove plugins uh, pretty easily. It's quite a sort of, if you had a look at the actual source code, there's a little space where we apply all the optimizations, and it's really easy to turn them off and on. We've actually disabled one. There was one we were uh, optimizing the HTML and turned out to be you know, successful, so we just turned it off. Uh, but yeah. It should be pretty easy to do that sort of stuff. And a lot of those pages or those sort of site builders have the same kind of problems, right? They kind of catch all solutions. So somebody's going to be plugging in some animation. Cool, let's include the entire animation library all the time. You know, things like that. So no, totally, I think you could apply a lot of it to all of these other page builders. And I don't know, maybe to other stuff as well, but um, certainly page builders make a lot of sense because of the copious amounts of generated code and like kind of having to do too many things at once, you know, they're not specialized systems. Cool. Uh, 
uh, you mentioned the step of using hand CSS. Right? Mm -hmm. How does that work? Do you completely remove the CSS that's not wanted, or do you just keep some of it so that you can use it later? Right, no, uh, so it's completely removed. So we start off with a project file, like this giant project file um, that, that's for everything, and we keep reusing that as a base starting point for every page. And then we just take an HTML page and say, cool, find the matching rules, and we'll get that as a string output, and then we just write that to a file and say, cool, now you're in this page's CSS file. Oh, so each page will always use the, the original? Yes, but, but instead, yeah, and then, and then just like take a smaller file instead. Uh -huh. So we're just always using that as a base oh, okay. uh, to start with, yeah, and then just like it's that nice modified file instead. Um, so yeah, it was it was a bit weird to kind of make sure it like pointed at the right thing afterwards, but yeah, that kind of worked out. I have a, a, a couple of questions. One is, am I right to say that it kind of offers a scale, kind of spending the kind of money that we do on like ads in Europe and stuff to try um, get developers on the platform and, and reach companies? At that kind of scale, like 10 15% improvements, uh, impacts SEO, impacts page ranking, uh, that kind of thing actually pays for itself. Is that right? Correct thing to say? Or? So, yeah, I'm not enough of an expert to know, but I showed the SEO expert and he was really happy with it. He said, like, a lot of these improvements were better. There were some reports afterwards that showed that we were actually doing a bit better. I can't remember those numbers, so I can't give you, like, a super solid response. But they were much better, and we got some good good results out of it potentially. Um, but I can't can't remember the exact improvements for the rankings. And uh, uh, we started to get better than some competitors, if I remember correctly. Um, but this was only the starting point, right? Like so, unfortunately, we do have to add to the system. Like LCP was the thing that we were targeting. We need to have a look at some of the other problems. Uh, they were talented. Um, Go and actually change up the image assets. Uh, so. Not enough has changed for it to be a significant impact, but there was some impact. And is there a reason that not more was done? Is that like a business decision? That, okay, we made the kind of improvement we wanted, we're not willing to invest more time to. I'm sure with this infrastructure, you could do a lot more than more plugins. We used to support that just more like a business trade off? Yeah, um, unfortunately, we're a small team and uh, we're constantly sort of overwhelmed by the kinds of requests that we need from the marketing space. Uh, growth, uh, growth team and also our own products uh, and you know so there's this four engineers which sounds like a lot but there's a lot to build um, and we constantly had like multiple projects on the run uh, amongst those, those engineers at the time and so just we had made it good enough as the business sort for now and certainly as our team sort because we also get to kind of have a way of things and yeah I think I would have preferred to spend a little bit more time on it we had some other critical releases that we had to do that were more impactful than slight changes to SEO ranking, like complete feature changes and allowing different audiences to come into our product. Those sort of things. It's hard to fight uh, use of kind of scale work, you know, sort of technical debt and all that sort of stuff versus features. So there's always that balance. But we did have a significant amount of time involvement. Like a month and a half is no slouch. <laughs> like yeah. being able to spend a chunk of that time to like, kind of scale up business. Get rid of some of the issues. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, from what I understand from your little like, flow diagram that you drew, like, the whole process of publishing to your new S3 bucket is also kicked off by publishing in your Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you can either publish to staging or to um, production. Yeah, yeah. I mean, essentially, it's just pick a domain. Yeah, it, it does exactly the same thing. And now, in terms of, I mean, you brought this from control software into this whole thing, the whole Git part. So, in terms of the commit message and creating new branch and the only Git flow stuff, like, is that, does that happen at all? Is it all automized or? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, it's all automatic. Um, so, we just have some basic automatic PR messaging. So, right. automatic PR gives it a number uh, for a branch, because mm -hmm. branches all have to be unique. In case we have yeah. like clashes, things like that. So it's a little bit gross looking uh, to some degree, um, and I think we didn't tidy up some of the branches. I think, uh, I'm pretty sure we added auto delete branches after merging at a point, but there are like 200 in there that are still yeah. sort of sitting around. But I mean, doesn't that mean you ended the same place where you were, where if somebody publishes, it just automatically publishes everything? 
Yeah, no, so it does, right? So it's still publishing everything, um, although it takes a few minutes now. Uh, so it's not like sort of 20 seconds because uh, we're running all these other processes and things. And there's a bit of tidying up that we could do in optimizing the system. Uh, we kind of apply a lot of things to all of the projects where we could like just target one. Um, but it's it's still it's still better in the end uh, because so we can block it before it goes live if we catch it just in time. But also we can load it back, and so we, you know, it's okay for something to go live for a short period of time as long as you can go fix it quickly. Um, yeah, we the workflow was just too much of a blocker for us to try and check every single VR. And there wasn't a way, there wasn't a way of sort of triggering it in workflow that could create a nice flow where you could say, oh no, this time I really mean it, or oh, this time I'm just testing and publish. You know, it wasn't like kind of a, a way of changing how you were interacting with the system. It's like it was too basic on the workflow side for us to kind of change what we were doing. Um, we did have a staging environment that was set up uh, where, where that would sort of do things, and then you still had to like manually merge production. Um, and we always default to staging for a while, but it was just, it was a lot of effort to kind of keep that running, and I think we needed another week or two to go and like make that system better, um, so that we could do something more with myself. So, so sorry to labor the point, but are you, are you really, I'm sure the answer is yes, but I'd like to understand how you found it better better off with these auto-generated commits on Git mm -hmm. than you were with just the automatic, automatic yeah. rollback points on so the automatic rollback points on Webflow are completely hidden, right? So there's, there's no way of you understanding what is inside that uh, chat. At least you can then look at the code now. Exactly. So, yeah, it's a little bit tedious, mm -hmm. but we can actually, there's a number of times where we've gone back and we said, okay, cool, it was like three PRs ago, right? Because we can see like the actions firing off and you know, what we're, like what's triggering it. Um, and then we can go and say like, oh, well, it was probably this change that's going to have a look for that text. Oh, we want to change it back to the other variation. Let's go find that version of the text, right? So we're just looking at like one or two files at a time in PR, even though they're thousands of changes. And since all of your stuff is regenerated basically from scratch every time, does Git realize that that as a change in the files, or is it just a bunch of files removed and a bunch of files added in? But yeah, it's it's a bit of a mix. Yes, that that is kind of a gross experience, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah so it's, it's super mixed, and then we're like PR merge conflicts and stuff. Sometimes that we have to go and manually clean up. It's much better now. So now it sort of automatically manages that, um, and just kind of prevents uh, merge conflicts. But yeah, it's not a perfect answer. So I don't think any of this is perfect. It's very much a bad thing still. Like it's slightly better than what we had. Uh, it's not like suddenly a magic new system. <laughs>
in the environment. Only people there or whatever. So that's the decent chances. And then that's your only entry. If you want to hang around for this big boy here, that's obviously only one. So you're three times less likely to, to win that. And then there is the coffee. And there are six uh, coffee margins. So, how should we do this? I have a poll. Um, so I think the first one, let's go for the big boy. The hamper. So if you want to, if you really want to go nuts, you really want this hamper, it's a high risk, high reward. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing the hamper, so go ahead and, uh, yeah. Copy hamper? No? Okay. Oh, you got some good chance. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that one, yeah. Anyone? Puppy hamper? Ah. Totally random, I saw that, so you didn't know it. Okay, who do we have? Sinchen! That's what I drink at home. I drink actually a South African bean roasted by them. Yes, we do make uh, coffee. It's great and it's actually kind of affordable. If you, like, in the, it's like really good coffee. So as really the coffee goes, it's affordable. Okay, so we have five to the way and you're getting one. That's another speaker gift, so I'll send that to you. Uh, okay, so who is non-conflicted here? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please close your eyes and pick six of them. <laughs> okay, you can give that to me. There's one. That's two. <coughs> there we go. I think that's three. That's four. That's five. A bit tricky is to not fold your thing up so much. <laughs> this surface area is not <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we have our minutes of the coffee. We have. I'm trying to read over <laughs> <laughs> it. <laughs> it. Okay, I'm going to hang on to these. In fact, can someone write this down for me? Sinjin, you want to write that? You can just sit. Pop that to me. Okay, Ed, congratulations. Thank you. You get some coffee. Yay. Yeah, yeah. Simo. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> okay. Trezor. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce. Mm -hmm. There's Bruce. Ah, there you are. Excellent. Ria. Yeah. Okay. And Rudolf. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, did you get all those, Sanjay? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Now, I'm going to go. Are there any who haven't it? Yes. <laughs> well, well if, if you don't get this, then one more. Ha. All right. That would be so painful. And I thought it's very okay. Jethro, can you close your eyes, please? Okay. Three. One. Two. Another two. 
us. Otherwise, they'll be very angry with you. Okay. Cool. So we have. Go. Well done. And. Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't fix it. And Trevor. Pick again. No, other Trevor. <laughs> Is this you, right? You're the intro that other trip in the car. Yeah. But but pick it pick again. Pick Pick someone else, I've already got it. You really got it. Alright. Oh you're going for the coffee, yeah. See, yeah, yeah, yeah. see. Okay. So we'll toss it out there. You see how you take responses out of it. Alright. This is Sam. You keen? Yeah. You want it? Good, you got it. Did you get that? Uh, those as well. No, I did not. It's Sam, it's <laughs> Gamu, and Tommy. That's the end yeah, right. It's very complicated. I don't know what's up in Ginger. Okay, and, and if I forget, please just I'll pop a message. Okay, so how you can contact. Uh, can I ask who's here for the first time? That is so cool. Who said for the first time and didn't win anything? Yes! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> fix it. Yeah, no, no that's, that's, that's great. Hey, well, welcome. Um, how did you hear about Fight Club? <laughs> you still I'm talk about it way too much for the Fight Club. Not until I do, right? If we gave recruitment awards, you'd get it, man. Didn't we? Personal post it on our Slack channel. Okay, yeah. cool. Nice. Let's yeah. go from here. Nice, nice. <laughs> LinkedIn. Okay, so everyone who part one is with a mark. Well, there you go. That's, that tells me about um, I think you linked in. I'll just spend less time on that now because <laughs> more time talking to people. Um, okay, fantastic. So, the very last thing before we go, uh, and just thank you again to um, Trevor Deco Development um, for sponsoring this tonight. Thank you to Offizen for the swag. Uh, does everyone uh, fill out the form? Yeah, That's cool. Good. Okay. Um, thanks to Trevor for the, the gift voucher. Thanks to uh, Coffee and Warren for the, the copy. And, um, and yeah, Jet Brains, as always. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I keep paying for Jet Brains. Yeah, I think they're supposed to give me a long story. Um, I love, I just love, I love the, the software. Um, but this year, I'll present it there. That's what I took for it. <laughs> okay, um, so we, there's so much um, scope to get involved and like create spaces. This is just a space, it's a platform for people to connect. Uh, people living in the area who are interested in, in software, uh, in uh, sort of elemental, um, to, to connect. And there are lots of things that we could be doing that we're not, for example, like having like coding kind of workshops, code jams, kinds of things. Um, so all these things, like the main limiting factor is energy. Um, and so like, if you have the energy, chat to me and say, hey, I really like to do this. Just in, inject your energy into the situation. Um, there's, there's a lot we can do to basically improve the world we, we live in. We all live in the software world, we all live in the south, or kind of around the south, and we, um, you know, this, this kind of thing is how you can basically um, improve the world that, that you live in, that your children have to live in. Um, and yeah, so there's lots of things to do. Please let me know. We also do like informal things like. Um, you know, go for coffee, go for swims, go for walks, hikes, um, this wine tasting that we've been threatening to do for a while. So if, if you have a kind of an interest, a passion that you'd like to share with us, um, passion is my passion is very contagious, so please come and share that with us. Say, hey, I, I, I do that go karting or you know, come this to a go karting thing. I'm sure you'll find people who would like to do that with you. And so let me know. Um, ZA Tech Slack is a great place to in channel Deep South Devs to get all the rest. Otherwise, meet up for anything. Take my number, take each other's numbers. And that's it. Cool. Thanks very much.
and pizza, drinks, that's it, we're done. <laughs>